Thank you, Mary. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for coming out this morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to be sharing some of my thoughts with you today. This topic is one that's very close to my heart, having written my dissertation on this some 35 years ago. It's hard to imagine it's been that long. But I find it, I think Jung's theory of shadow and evil uh, is just as relevant today as it was 35 years ago or 100 years ago when he was writing about it. Uh, certainly it's relevant to understanding the divisiveness and I think the social and political chaos and abuse in the world. And I think most of us here would probably agree that we're living through a period right now of tremendous divisiveness and chaos in this country and throughout the world. And I think Jung was a real visionary on this topic. He did a lot to begin bri bridging the chasm that existed, I think, in the early 20th century between psychology and spirituality. And of all the complexities of the human psyche that he described, I don't think any is more relevant or more brilliant than his view on the shadow and how it becomes projected and in collective projection leads to a lot of the problems that divide us. This morning I hope to do the following. First I'm going to outline briefly Jung's understanding of the structure of the psyche in a very skeletal way. I won't go into depth on that. I want to talk mostly about the shadow and the role of the shadow plays. And then I'm going to offer a bit of historical and current illustrations of collective shadow projection. And finally, I want to discuss a little bit how both in psychotherapy and spiritual practice we can address this issue and help both ourselves and those with whom we work better come to terms with the shadow side of our personality. I will stop a couple of times for Q&A for questions and discussion, but please feel free to interrupt me at any point or, you know, if there's anything that's unclear or fuzzy about what I'm saying. Midway through the presentation, I will lead you through an exercise which we'll do together, and we will take about a five-minute break, roughly halfway through the presentation. I'm going to begin with a description of a piece of my own experience. Uh, I grew up in a family where there was very little expression of anger, and confrontation and anger were taboo. The unwritten but very prominent assumption in our household was that if you feel angry, something is very wrong with you and you better keep it to yourself. <laughs> My father, who was a gentle and very kind man, used to like to quote a line from an old Mills Brothers song, which is called, Please Don't Talk About Me When I'm Gone. The line is, if you can't say anything real nice, it's better not to talk at all, is my advice. Well, one morning when I was four years old, and my mother, my, my brother, my parents, and I were all sitting around the breakfast nook in our kitchen in southwest Los Angeles, where I grew up. My father announced that, for reasons I don't remember, that I couldn't go to the cartoon show at the local Alto Theater the next morning, Saturday morning. I was very upset. I became very angry, and I threw a bit of a tantrum, and I ran out of the kitchen yelling, I wish you weren't my daddy, as I ran into my bedroom. A couple of minutes later, my mother came into the, my room and said to me, Kim, you just destroyed your father. Uh, it's interesting that I remember that so clearly. It's one of those significant defining moments that affects your entire life. Now, I want to fast forward to a few weeks ago when I was watching a TV program. I don't even remember if it was a film. But in this film, there was a very sadistic military commander, a real bad guy. Uh, who was abusive toward the men under his command. And he, in this film, is confronted and humiliated by one of his superiors. And while this is happening, while I'm watching this, I feel myself getting very excited. I start fantasizing myself choking this sadistic commander, beating on him. And in fact, I get so worked up that my blood pressure starts rising, and I start, and my heart's racing, and I'm afraid that I'm going to go into atrial fibrillation. <laughs> And I thought, I think, what am I doing? I want to kill this somebody. Why am I so worked up about this? And this is not the first time that I've had this kind of experience watching this kind of scene. Now, I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to see some connection between the interjections of my parents' views on anger and what I was feeling when I was watching that film. I think it's an example, Freud would call this an example, among other things, of the return of the repressed, and it certainly was that. But I think there was more involved. 
And here's where I find Jung helpful. I think this was a perfect example of me projecting the anger in my shadow, which is where much of my anger still resides today, onto the man whom I wanted to kill while I was watching this film. What makes it stand out as shadow projection is the sudden, overwhelming intensity of what I was feeling and the fantasy of acting it out. Not that psychoanalytic theory in general doesn't account for such behavior, but I think that seeing it as shadow projection is the most helpful way of understanding it, and hopefully this will become apparent as I say more about how Jung understood the shadow and how it operates. Like Freud, Jung saw the psyche to be constructed of conscious and unconscious realms, with the conscious ego representing for most just the tip of the iceberg. And like Freud, he understood much of human behavior to be motivated and dictated by the flow and transformation of libido or psychic energy between the unconscious realm of the psyche and the conscious ego. However, Jung's understanding of psychic energy or libido differed from Freud's in two important respects. First, Freud saw the psyche to be a closed system within which there existed a fixed amount of libido. For Jung, on the other hand, the quantity of libido does not remain, does not remain constant. A new experience, especially when it emerges from the collective realm, what he called the collective unconscious, can result in a tremendous increase of energy within the personal psyche. And Jung broke off most distinctly from Freud in positing that beneath this personal unconscious, in which resides all early memories, repressions, trauma, etc. There's a deeper and much larger collective unconscious, which we share with all of humanity. And in this collective realm, one finds the archetypes, the themes by which myth is made, and which Jung felt can give great power in affecting human behavior. He felt that there is far greater energy within that collective unconscious than in the personal unconscious making it a far more powerful driver of human behavior for both good and evil. Secondly, while Freud asserted that libido consisted primarily of primitive, instinctual sexuality and aggression, Jung perceived it as a more inclusive life force, an elan vital, which he described in his words, quote, an energy which is able to communicate itself to any field of activity, whatever, be it power, hunger, hatred, sexuality, or religion, without ever being itself a specific instinct. Jung suggested that energy within the psyche operates according to two laws, the principle of equivalence and the principle of entropy. And these are two ter terms in physics. The principle of equivalence is almost identical to the first law of thermodynamics in physics which is for a given quantity of energy expanded or consumed in bringing about a certain condition, an equal quantity of that same or another form of energy will appear elsewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, psychologically, this means that when a conscious value disappears from the conscious psyche or the conscious ego, we must look for a substitute formation with an equivalent value to spring up somewhere else on a deeper unconscious level. Secondly, the principle of entropy is equivalent to the second law of thermodynamics in physics, and is stated psychologically as follows. If two values or two energy intensities are of unequal strength, energy will tend to pass from the stronger value into the weaker one until a balance is achieved. The concept of polarity is very much inherent in this principle of entropy. And Jung suggests that in accordance with this principle, psychic energy is constantly seeking to maintain a balance between polar opposites. He says, quote, the concept of energy implies that of polarity, since a current of energy necessarily presupposes two different states or poles without which there can be no current. Any electrician can tell you that. Every energetic phenomenon consists of pairs of opposites, beginning and end above and below, hot and cold, cause and effect, good and evil. Now this sounds a bit more complicated than it is. In essence, Jung is saying that within the psyche, and he means both the personal and collective psyche, energy is constantly moving between polar opposites, trying to establish an equilibrium. 
He suggests that this is a universal archetypal principle that is illustrated in what he called the de profundis motif. De profundis is Greek for out of the depths, such as in the, when the psalmist says, out of the depths my heart cries to thee, O Lord. Uh, and in this de profundis motif, it is a motif that says that in the depths, in the darkness, comes the light. From the darkness emerges the light or change. Uh, from the depths of despair, you find salvation in your life. You can't have one without the other. And this is a motif that I have found, I think is reflected, as Jung said, in mythology, in religion, in art, in literature. And Jung suggests it is a basic feature of human life and of the human psyche. We see examples of this de profundis motif everywhere. In the Old Testament, we read that Yahweh had to harden the hearts of the Israelites before they could see the truth. They had to experience plagues in Egypt before they could cross over to the Promised Land. The psalmist suggests that perhaps we must walk through the valley of the shadow of death before our cup will runneth over. In the New Testament, Paul has to be blinded before he sees the light. Jesus has to spend 40 days in the wilderness before he finds his way, similar to what the Buddha went through. And he has to be crucified before he can be resurrected. In mythology, the phoenix rises out of its own ashes. The hero must slay the dragon before he finds himself. In fairy tales, the hero must be a frog before it can become a prince. The bird must be the ugly duckling before it can become the pretty swan. In 12-step programs, we often hear that one has to hit rock bottom before you can emerge upward and find permanent sobriety. You could give a thousand different examples of this Fibrofundis motif. For Jung, this was central to how energy moves and works in the universe and in the human psyche. Jung suggested that when any neglected content within the unconscious attracts sufficient energy to itself because it's been neglected by the ego, it will eventually tend to turn into its opposite in an attempt to compensate for the imbalance. He called this an antiodromia, which is a fancy Greek term, which simply means the tendency of something to turn into its opposite. Jung described this process as follows. He said, the superabundance of any force inevitably turns into its opposite. This characteristic phenomenon practically always occurs when an extreme one-sided tendency dominates conscious life. In time, an equally powerful counterposition is built up in the unconscious which first inhibits the conscious performance and subsequently breaks through the conscious control. Now, Jung's critics, including Freud, found this idea, which is not unlike the concept of yin and yang in Taoism, to be mystical, unscientific. And ultimately, this was at the core of what led to the irreparable split between Jung and Freud. And yet this theory of energy is central to Jung's understanding of the projection of the shadow. And here's how. For Jung, the large outer part of the conscious ego which interacts with the world is what he called the persona. It's most of what we know consciously of ourselves. It's how we want to be viewed. It's how we try to view ourselves, how we want others <coughs> to view us. And there are several aspects. It's not just the persona, it's actually persona, the plural, uh, that correspond to the various roles. For example, in my life, there is persona of me as father, as one as brother, as husband, as psychotherapist, as teacher, as Buddhist practitioner, as Methodist minister, etc., etc. My persona are comprised of all the values of what I want to be and how I want others to view me in these various roles. I want to be seen as kind, compassionate, generous, intelligent, competent, and the list goes on and on. I think you get the idea. Mm -hmm. In both the personal and collective regions of my unconscious, there exists the counter persona, the shadow. And the shadow is comprised of the polar opposites to all, virtually all, the values of my conscious persona. If my persona is to be generous and compassionate, in my shadow I am stingy and abusive. James Hillman portrays this vividly when he describes the shadow as a 
criminal, an idiot child, a piece of feces inside the water spigot staining the fresh water as it flows, an older hardened child abuser, a Nazi. One after another, says Hillman, like a police lineup, they wait for identification and acknowledgement. Yes, this too is mine. Not a pretty picture. <laughs> of course, Hillman had a flair for the dramatic. But the point is, there is no quality that is too disgusting or too evil, according to Jung, to be part of the shadow that each of us carries within us. We all have the capacity to be a racist, an abuser, a Nazi, a terrorist. Everything that we detest consciously and do not wish to be taken, do not wish to be, takes root within our unconscious shadow side. Now the shadow is not all negative. It also contains the positive counterparts to all the negative views that we may consciously have of ourselves. If I have a conscious aversion to social contact, there is within my shadow a raging extrovert. <laughs> if I see myself as inferior and incompetent, within my shadow are the qualities that make for a competent, deserving human being. So the shadow contains everything that is a polar opposite to my conscious perception, both positive and negative. Unfortunately for most of us, the negative aspects of the shadow are the ones that cause most problems for us and are the most dangerous. For Jung, the psyche is morally or ethically neutral. It's neither essentially good nor essentially evil. The energy within the psyche is not trying to achieve good or evil. It's trying to achieve a balance of Jung between all polar opposites. And for Jung, that balance is the key to positive mental health. He felt that the most dangerous state for all of us is what he calls psychic one-sidedness. I think you'll understand this if you think in terms of the Myers-Briggs test, which I'm sure that most of you, most of us have taken at one time or maybe several times. The test is based on three sets of polarities that Jung defined. Thinking versus feeling, intuition versus sensation, introversion versus extroversion. And for Jung, the healthiest state we could achieve would be an equal development in our personality of all six of these qualities. Of course, nobody ever really achieves that. But the Myers-Briggs test can actually be a helpful tool for achieving that in part. For example, if you come out very one-sided on the thinking pole, hopefully you'll put some effort into developing more than the feeling pole, and so forth. But what happens with any polarity within the psyche, says Jung, is that when too much of our conscious energy is invested in one side of any polarity, one, our psychic energy following the principle of entropy will tend to migrate to the neglected pole, and that will build up unconsciously. The more energy that goes to the conscious, to the unconscious neglected side, the more likely that that unconscious shadow side is going to break through and be acted out in a destructive fashion. And this is exacerbated by the fact that when there are large quantities of energy lying in the neglected personal shadow, unconscious, that those, those uh, qualities will tend to attract energy from the same contents that are existing in the collective unconscious. So what you are personally experiencing in your shadow will tend to gather greater energy from what collective values uh, are connected to. <coughs> when we become too identified with our persona and totally out of touch with our shadow side, the shadow becomes like a cannon or a bomb or a volcano ready to explode. And this explosion often comes through the mechanism of projection. Now, I'm going to explain that in just a moment. First, I just want to, uh, at this point, just take a couple moments. Are there any questions or, about what I've been saying so far? Yes. Just, um, I'm curious. I understand and have experienced a lot of what you're saying in terms of polarity. But what I've noticed, even in my own development and with others, is that sometimes it appears people are very good, they have certain values that they fight for. And what they attract is the opposite. It's not, it's not so much that the 
inter there's the internal conflict as much as the external. So someone is very good and they'll attract people who are just the opposite. Is that the way the projection works out? Well, I, it makes sense that, that's, that's, uh, that that principle of entropy would work in, in interpersonal relations in a way like that, too. Yes, I do think that opposites, the idea that opposites attract. I think there is something fundamentally true about that. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, so, so I'm dealing very much with that, uh, but I don't think that that's the Because that I would not define anymore. I wouldn't hold together anymore. It would be like uh, being just in an energy field, and that would be freeing me in a sense. But as still identifying it as me, those two things, uh, they have to give up their, their conceptions in order to live it. I don't know if I'm Well, no, I, I hear what you're saying. And, you know, uh, I mean, first of all, it's probably the hardest thing in the world to achieve that balance. But, but for Jung, achieving the balance doesn't mean you end up in the middle somewhere. Mm. It doesn't mean you end up uh, with vanilla, you know, as opposed to something more exotic. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it means that, it simply means that when you make choices then, which may be one or the other side of the pole, that you are aware of the full range from which you're choosing. That's the important thing. Part of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, on another note, Kim, I'm thinking about you mentioned several polarities, right. um, and I just wanted to comment on the 12-step one um, because mm -hmm. I think that uh, there is that notion out there that you have to hit rock bottom and then you'll get help, and I think that that is um, not necessarily so, right. and that people get well without hitting bottom. And that there's a progression, you know, with any kind of addictive process. So I would just want to say, no, you don't have to about bottom. We can intervene way before bottom yeah. arrives. I mean, yes, I mean, think, and that's true of all the aspects of that. They put it, it's kind of a, it, 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 it's a polarizing things, even saying it in that in those terms. It's not an absolute principle. It's something that more or less. Occurs, it occurs enough that you can see it as a universal theme, but there are plenty of exceptions. Yeah, and I think that in the general public, I think that notion, you know, really still exists a lot that, well, you've got to hit bottom. Right. You know, I think there's that kind of right. feeling, and I think mm -hmm. that people get hurt by that mm -hmm. idea. Right. And maybe sometimes what you're saying, too, is if you can just see what bottom is mm -hmm. without having achieved it, mm -hmm. that yeah. it's as good, you know, if you have that awareness. Recognize your powerlessness. Right. Yeah. Yeah. As you know, I have a lot of experience with the Myers Briggs type indicator. I've been using it for yeah, 30 years. Oh, at, 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 I've been using the Myers Briggs type indicator for about 30 years. And when you're in a position to help people see the difference between the polarities and how to move more towards one side or another, what I found in my development as an adult was uh, I am profoundly introverted. Um, but no one, no, no one believes I'm introverted because I've adapted the extrovert smile mm -hmm. in, in a sense. Mm -hmm. And what that's done is opened up a whole range of possibilities in terms of engagement with the world and then the internal filter that I use on that. So yeah, that, that whole idea of, of polarities and when you can join them, the kind of awareness uh, that comes out of that is, is very striking. Right. Right. Yeah, I think I'm going to move on and we'll have some more questions later. Jung suggests that when energy builds up in the unconscious shadow, those contents tend to be projected onto others. And that's where they become dangerous. Now I think we all know what projection is, but I'm going to just look at it for a moment. Uh, and, and certainly it's, of all the defense mechanisms, this is one that I think all of us use virtually every day. And, <laughs> and perhaps none is more prevalent uh, no, there is no defense that is more prevalent or more craftily complex than projection. And I want to give a very simple, somewhat simplistic, common example of that. Let's say I wake up one morning in a bad mood, and for reasons I'm totally unaware of, I am not, 
I'm feeling grumpy, but I don't think I'm angry. I don't think there's anything wrong with me. And I greet my wife at the breakfast table with a somewhat grumpy greeting. And her good morning in response seems less than enthusiastic, partly because she sees that I'm in a bad mood. So I say to her, you seem a bit unfriendly this morning. Are you angry? <laughs> and she replies, no, 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 I'm not angry. I'm fine. <laughs> and, she, uh, you know, and I persist. You should have heard the way you said good morning. You could have been greeting a bedpost. And I think you're angry. You're in a bad mood. I can see it. And she says, no, really, I'm not angry. What's up with you? And I reply, aha, the tone of your voice. You are angry. And of course, I've managed to provoke her. And now she says, now I am getting pissed. And I say, aha, I knew it. I knew it. You are angry. And of course, I have managed to provoke from her the very response that will make me continue in my projection that I'm not angry. She's the one. And what this rather simple illustration uh, illustrates is that, and what makes pro projections often so hard to recognize, is that they have hooks. In this little exchange, I managed to hook her anger, provoking from her the very response that confirms my projected perception and keeps me from saying that I'm the one who's angry. Now, how many arguments and fights begin in this fashion that happens all the time? Those of us who do marriage counseling, not, well, did our own marriage, but in the doing marriage counseling, you see it a lot. I think it's safe to say that each of us is involved in multiple projections similar to this with some frequency. Now, hopefully, if we have some degree of self awareness, we learn to own many of these projections before they develop into unnecessary conflict. But we don't project our feelings only onto those with whom we're in close contact or verbal contact. We also project feelings, ideas, thoughts, ideologies onto collective entities that we observe or think about every day. And this is where it becomes both complicated and dangerous. If projection were only an individual phenomenon, it would be far less problematic. But there's a lot of projection that occurs collectively. As a member of a family, an ethnic group, a religious faith, a community, a country, a political party, etc. I find myself participating in collective projections onto other groups, which the particular groups of which I'm a part find objectionable. Jung felt that there's a lot of power in these collective projections. Indeed, there's a lot of power in group psychology. In any group, Jung would say, and I would agree with this, that the whole is almost always greater than the sum of its parts. Projection not only have hooks, they also are contagious especially when they are promulgated by a group of people. I think most of, the, of us experience this quite a bit. Uh, if you're part of any kind of meditative group, uh, and you meditate in a, in a group sometimes, like I do at the Buddhist temple that I attend, there's something going on, there's something in that group that is far greater than the energy I feel when I'm meditating alone at home. Mm -hmm. Some kind of positive karma or some kind of energy that is greater because of the collective because we're all doing this together. Or sometimes when we're in situations where something happens where something breaks through that's beautiful and almost brings tears because it's a wonderful thing, and we're with a group of people that experience this, it's a much more powerful experience when it occurs in a group mm -hmm. than when it occurs alone. Now, unfortunately, that, I mean, when that's happening, we're more aware of that when that happens positively. I don't think we're nearly as much aware when it's happening on a negative in a negative sense. Because when we do this projection uh, collectively uh, of negative shadow, uh, the last thing we want to be aware of is that this is what we're doing. The last thing we want to be aware of is that we even have this shadow side to ourselves. Uh, Jung would suggest that the vast majority of hostility expressed between groups of all sizes and shapes toward other groups, from families, or religions, or ethnic groups, to communities, or whole nations, and this includes all of human warfare, is the result, at least in part, and probably a great part, of this quite complex phenomenon of collective shadow projection. He felt that it is at the root of most racism, sexism, prejudice of every type, genocide, and war. The simple psychological truth beneath this is the fact that in order to avoid 
facing the unpleasant shadow within us, we have to create enemies who can become scapegoats on whom we can project. Mm -hmm. And history is replete with examples of this. Uh, there are many I could talk about uh, Turkey, what the Turkish did to the Armenians. I can talk about more recently in Rwanda and in Uganda and what happened in South Africa during much of the last century. But I will give an example of, because it, it fits this nicely in some ways, is what happened in Nazi Germany a long time ago. After losing World War I and experiencing a financial depression far greater than we've experienced in this country, uh, with the German marks so worthless that one had to walk around with wheelbarrows full of German marks to buy anything in Germany, the morale of the German people between the two wars, who had been once been proud Prussians, was depleted and was at an all-time low. A kind of rampant national inferiority complex was building up in Germany. And then in the midst of this came Adolf Hitler, a man who suggested that not only were the German people not inferior, they were the superior race, the Ubermensch, the great blonde beast. And of course, this is exactly what most wanted and needed to hear. The large parades and huge gatherings in stadiums with 100,000 people, the kick step soldiers, stirred up the passions of the German masses. But as they bought into this new idea, we are the superior people, what, they, what were they to do with the sense of inferiority that had been building up within them for such a long time? They had to project it somewhere. Following the law of entropy, a scapegoat had to be found. And what better target for this than the Jewish people, most of whom had immigrated to Germany from Russia and Eastern Europe, who tended to be dark haired, not like the great blonde beast, and who had been the object of ridicule and abuse over the centuries, and thus emerged the horrors of Nazi Germany. Now, I'm sure there are many other factors going on sociologically and so on, but this was a major factor, I think, that was on the target here. What the Holocaust in Germany demonstrates only too clearly is that when an entire ethnic or national group projects its collective shadow onto another group, there becomes only one way to keep that projection alive and justify it, and that is by trying to eliminate the scapegoat. If we Nazis can destroy all of those Jews, these less than human beings, who embody all that is evil and inferior in the world, we'll be doing a good thing we'll be making the world a safer place for everyone else. Hence, the ovens of Dachau and Buchenwald. Now clearly, not all Germans, and maybe not even a majority of those in Nazi Germany bought totally into this view of the Jews. But there were enough who did to give, to give the collective shadow projection the power that led to the extermination of millions of innocent people. And again, like I said, the same thing has occurred in so many places throughout the globe in the last century and, for, and forever. That's how collective shadow projection works. Now, we'd like to think that something like that could never occur in this country, right? But our own history suggests otherwise. In this country, historically, it initially took less the shape of jingoistic national pride than racism. In the first 200 years of this country's life, this occurred, I think, simultaneously on two fronts. On the one hand was the nearly complete genocide of Native Americans, who were seen as savages, less than human, worthy of being slaughtered without any sense of guilt or fear of retribution. You know, something we never read in history books, I certainly didn't as a child, never did my kids, that in the mid-19th century, our own government sent thousands of blankets infected with smallpox to Native American reservations in the hopes of annihilating these populations. Our government did that. The American Indians became a scapegoat for the collective shadow of the increasingly gentrified white population who were cut off from their own primitive natural earthbound society. Of course, there were also questions of greed and territorial and so on going on here. Equally striking, perhaps more so, is our history with African Americans who were brought to this country as slaves and seen from the beginning as savage and less than human. Those of color became the scapegoats for the collective shadow of all whites, but particularly those who owned property and were gentrified or money. And where better to project the dark side, quote, than onto those of dark skin? 
And for all that has happened to further civil rights, and a lot has happened for Native Americans and people of color, I think we, hopefully we are aware that we are far from having achieved full ownership of that massive racial shadow projection to which all, by which all of us have been contaminated. In our recent history in this country, our collective shadow projections have taken on more of a jingoistic, nationalistic tone. In the two world wars, the Germans and then the Japanese became clearly our enemies. And I'm old enough to remember in the early 1940s uh, how in movies and films and newscasts, the Germans and Japanese were depicted as terribly sadistic, evil, awful people. But when the war was over and we had to let go of that, we had to find a new enemy. And of course, Russia and then all communist nations became the recipients of our collective shadow projection. Growing up, I remember on many occasions hearing politicians saying, if we could rid the world of all communists, we'd make it a safe place for everyone. Mm -hmm. And I remember only too well as a child watching the McCarthy hearings on television, the awful things that that man did. The rhetoric remained the same, only the object had changed. It's now the communists. In the current era, of course, jihadists have been labeled as a new enemy. Unfortunately, far too often, it's not only the terrorists who are seen as the enemy, but all Muslims, or even all people of Middle Eastern descent. On a recent trip to California where I grew up, I was horrified when a childhood friend of mine who was politically on a different end of the spectrum from me, but <laughs> said they ought to just drop a bomb, uh, an H-bomb on Iran, as if that would make everything fine. Uh, now, this is not to suggest at all that all political ideologies or political actions or strategies are equally good or bad. Terrorism is a bad thing. Abuse, I think we'd all agree, abuse, genocide, murder, war are bad wherever and whenever they occur. But when collective shadow projection occurs, it is generally destructive because it is usually marked by the attitude, if we could just destroy or get rid of all those fill in the blanks, the world would be a safer place for everybody. And what we lose sight of with that perspective is that what we most detest we most detest in those whom we want to destroy, not only exists in them, it also exists within us, within our own shadows. One could make a pretty good case for the fact that we in the West have created, or at the very least exacerbated, much of the terrorism that exists in the Middle East right now by our aggressive military action in Iraq and Afghanistan. Perhaps ISIS is the Frankenstein monster that we helped to create. Now, what, what has been lacking on a national collective level is our awareness of our own shadow, the terrorist within us, which, if given the opportunity, would destroy whole plants or nations to make the world a safer place. And I think what an understanding of shadow projection teaches us is that so long as it remains primarily a question of us and them, we the good and they the evil, however we want to describe that, there will be no lasting workable solution because we will constantly have to find new enemies onto whom we can project the shadow and we'll, as long as we are unwilling to view it and accept it within ourselves. Now I think most of us would agree that we live in a fractured world. This is what this whole series is called. Mm -hmm. A world that is broken, a world in which far too much shadow projection dominates political power and action. And nowhere is that more apparent than in the polarized, divisive political atmosphere in the U.S. right now in the midst of the current presidential race. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> it's been an interesting and bizarre time when you agree. The country is so divided and polarized as much as, as it is today. Can you imagine, just to take an example, a, a greater divide between two presidential candidates or two who would like to be president than that between Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders? <laughs> Each represents, on some level, the shadow side of the other. Now, to be fair and rational, without trying to take political sides too much, I think, <laughs> I think that in figures like Donald Trump and Ted Cruz, we see larger-than-life caricatures 
of what Jung would call one-sided personalities, mm -hmm. who seem to be inviting the public to share in their shadow projections by demonizing Muslims, immigrants, poor people, sometimes women. What they're teaching and preaching is frightening from a psychological perspective because it's almost a perfect clinical example of shadow projection due to a lack of self-awareness and to a narcissistic hunger for power that is rooted in finding a common enemy or enemies. And God help us if either one of these men become the president of this country. Not to be too political or anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not really too political. I don't think many of you would disagree with that, but I'm, I'm going to say it anyway. But, but we have to be careful here. We have to be careful. Well, I think it's important to see people like Trump and Cruz with some objectivity and appropriate apprehension. It may be far too easy to demonize them. It's far too easy to fantasize destroying the Trumps and the Cruzes and people like them in order to make the world a safer place for everybody else, right? And if Jung were alive today and could see the incredible polarization that exists right now within this country and to a lesser extent throughout the Western world, I think he would see it as a very dangerous situation. A situation that has the potential to lead to great violence, something that we see at the Trump political rallies, mm -hmm. perhaps to political assassinations at some point, to fighting and irreparable alienation among families and friends, to various violent ends. What needs to happen, and yet seems so far from reality right now, is for all the sides in these political polarities to somehow seek or find common ground. For each to see, for each to see within ourselves, both individually and collectively, that by demonizing our adversaries, however we may define them, we're projecting the worst of ourselves onto them, which they only too easily provoke, let me say, because they offer so many hopes for these projections. But rather than finding a way to appeal to the humanity in them, and through these projections, we may be painting ourselves into a kind of corner that we can't escape from and can lead to even greater chaos and alienation. So what can we do about this? How can we better learn to come to terms with our personal and collective shadow? How can we learn to tame the terrors that exist within all of us? All right, before Addressing that question, I'm going to we're going to take just a short five-minute break, and then I'm going to have you do an exercise, and I'm going to address that question. Now, for perhaps the most difficult task uh, when dealing with this topic, and that is, how can we hope to come to terms with our shadow side, both individually and collectively, so that it becomes a less potent and destructive force in us and in the world? First, let me say very clearly, this might be the most difficult task that we're ever faced with. Asking the question is a bit like when one of the disciples asked Gautama Buddha, how long will it take me to learn to meditate perfectly with a mind that is free of all distraction? And the Buddha responded, 10,000 lifetimes. Which means that you'll never really achieve it, but you hope to get as far with it as you can. Similarly, Jung confessed, having spent most of the last half of his life trying to come to terms with his own shadow, and felt that he fell far short of achieving that to his satisfaction. But he didn't feel that, therefore, it's not worth the effort any more than Buddha felt that it's not worth the effort to learn to become mindful and meditate. And what we need to acknowledge at the outset is that what we're not seeking, we are not seeking perfection in this quest because that's something we can't achieve. But whatever progress we make is worth the effort and can make a difference. Jung suggested that our perfectionism can be our biggest enemy in trying to deal with the shadow. The more we try to be perfect in any way in our lives, the more we provide energy for the shadow which attracts all of our imperfections. And this is a difficult idea to grasp in some ways, and it's not a pleasant one, it's counterintuitive. But for Jung, it's paramount. He suggests that good mental health and all that goes with that, includes, including being a good citizen, is not achieved simply by trying to be good, however we may define that, but rather by trying to be whole, by trying to be balanced, 
by trying to find the reasonable balance between the polarities in our psyche. And as I said before, that doesn't mean choosing vanilla or something uninteresting. It rather it means that as we make choices on one or another side of any polarity, it's important the more that we can be aware of the full range of what we are choosing from. Joseph Goldbrunner is a Catholic theologian and psychologist and a strong devotee of Jung, wrote a book called Holiness is Wholeness. And Goldbrunner makes the point that in the Judeo-Christian tradition, we've been taught sometimes to our detriment that to be holy means to be good. But when we try too hard to be good, we may end up disowning and repressing all those parts of our character that we see as bad, and those then get relegated to the shadow. And the harder we try to be only good, then following the law of entropy, the more energy migrates to the shadow, and the more it's likely then to be projected destructively onto other groups of people or individuals, and we're more likely to take destructive action toward them, finding scapegoats. Now, if we're to avoid this, Goldbrenner suggests that the goal we need to espouse is not to be good, but rather to be whole. To acknowledge and incorporate all aspects of our character into our self-awareness. But what does that mean, exactly? It's a bit complicated. First of all, as we said earlier, not all the contents of the shadow are negative, as maybe you and your two people over here experienced during the exercise. It was nice to see the combination. And we would be hard pressed for us to have a consensus on uh, totally on what deserves to be labeled as good or evil. Now there are certain things that most of us here would agree are evil. Uh, abusive behavior, oppression, genocide, extreme greed, I think we would all pretty much agree on that. But once you get past the big ones, it gets trickier. In essence, some may see some things as good that somebody else may see as bad or evil. Or even as we grow and mature, what seemed bad at one point in our life may actually later seem to be not so bad and maybe even good. Again, drawing on my own experience, I think of the experience of my maternal grandmother, who had a, quite an effect on me in my formative years. She was a lovely person. She was also a very puritanical, fundamentalistic Christian. She made it very clear to me that certain things like alcohol, cigarettes, profanity, any sexual activity more than holding hands before marriage was the work of the devil and a sure road to hell. Mm -hmm. And I bought into this largely up until in my late teens. Fortunately, I think, <laughs> I began to see much of this differently when I left home, went to college, and especially when I graduated from college and went to Paris, France for two years. Much of what my grandmother had taught me was evil and had been relegated to my shadow now became integrated in my life and actually felt pretty good. I'll leave it to your imagination for me. <laughs> uh, I later had a very interesting dream uh, when I was in my 30s when I was training to be a therapist about my grandmother. Uh, I saw her sitting at a table playing poker with some men, <laughs> drinking a whiskey and smoking a cigarette. <laughs> I really think that. Uh, I was shocked when I said to her, Grandma, what are you doing? This can't be you. Having a good time. <laughs> she said, Kim, much of what I taught you was wrong. I never should have told you those things. Aren't dreams wonderful? Right? Well, my experience with the shifting of contents within my own shadow is not unusual. Jung suggested that many things that we initially denounce or repress later come to be seen not only as acceptable, but maybe even helpful and good or beneficial. That's one of the positive aspects that come from integrating certain shadow contents. But secondly, there does remain the fact that those shadow contents that most of us would agree are evil when lived out also need to be integrated more into our self-awareness. And how do we do that? How can we learn to really accept that each of us has within us the potential to be a Nazi, a child molester, a serial killer, a terrorist, without losing whatever self-respect we have or what faith we have in human nature. Well, the first thing I think we need to learn is that none of us is unique in this respect. That the shadow is an existential reality for all of us. There's no person on this earth that does not have a shadow side. And therefore, it's something we need not feel shame or guilt about. My humanity is not polluted 
by the fact that I have a chef. <coughs> but how do we come to that self-awareness? How, how do we help others that we work with to achieve that? Again, it's something you never totally achieve. You spend your whole life working on it. But it is something that's not likely to occur easily on a collective level. Though there are some, some examples of that where I think it has occurred to some extent. For example, when I was talking about Nazi Germany, I think that if you go to Germany today and you see all the memorials everywhere and in every classroom about the Holocaust, I think there is within the German psyche a sense that we're not totally without sin that, and we don't want this kind of thing to ever, ever happen again. But that's unusual. Not many nations or people seem capable collectively of recognizing that through their projections they have played a major role in creating their own enemies. Certainly I think this country is a long way <coughs> seeing that. Uh, ultimately I think this kind of awareness has to occur more on an individual level, young felt that as well. That the question really comes down to how can we become more self-aware in this way? How can we learn to, in some ways, at least begin to see and accept the shadow of each character? I think there's an increasing awareness among people today that we do live in a fractured world and that things are askew. I think it's very difficult to be in total denial about things like climate change, about economic inequality, about the economic volatility of the entire globe since 2008, about the craziness of a political culture that could allow Donald Trump to be running for president. I think there's a readiness, as it were, to begin to see that there's a shadow side to our culture, and therefore in each of us. And this theme emerges more and more in our popular culture, in films, and TV shows. Now, two TV shows which I confess to having been gotten hooked on, thanks to my older son, who's got me hooked on, on, uh, on uh, what is it? Netflix. Netflix, thank you. <laughs> See your moment. But uh, two shows that I've come to watch uh, and, and uh, enjoy, uh, enjoyed in quotes, but which I think share this shadow theme are Breaking Bad yeah. and The Walking Dead. I do confess to watch The Walking Dead. I think it's well done. But what better example can you find of a man so oblivious to his shadow? He's transformed before our eyes from a pretty decent person to an abusive monster sociopath and the figure of Walter White in Breaking Bad. <laughs> but what better example could you find of the primitive elements of our nature that get relegated to the shadow and then haunt us unceasingly than the never-ending stream of indestructible zombies in The Walking Dead? We don't have to look far to see examples of shadow projection in our popular culture. It's as though that maybe on some level there's a bit of a preoccupation with the shadow that comes up again and again. And I'd like to think that this may reflect an increasing readiness to come to terms collectively with the problem of shadow projection. Those of us who are therapists, as many of us are, know how difficult it is to help anyone begin to achieve an awareness of this problem. Yeah, I think that I, it's an important part of what most of us do in our work every day. One of the ways I think we do this is by helping our clients to distinguish between feeling and action. If there is one universal principle in psychology which I think is indisputable, is this: we are not responsible for what we feel. We don't choose to feel what we feel. Our feelings come upon us. But we are responsible for what we do with those feelings. And the psyche sometimes has a difficult time making this distinction. When Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, he who has looked upon a woman with lust has committed adultery in his heart. He's reflecting a significant psychological reality. The psyche can too quickly equate the thought or fantasy with the action and feel the same guilt for either. And that's unfortunate. I don't think this is what the Sermon on the Mount is trying to teach. Jesus is not quoted as saying, he who looks with lust upon a woman should be denounced and relegated to hell. On the contrary, he says elsewhere, that he who is without sin throw the first stone. Or, be aware of the plank in your own eye before attending to the splinter in your brother's eye. So I think much of our work as therapists involves helping our clients to see that however distorted, dark, or disgusting their thoughts or fantasies may be, when not acted out, 
does not constitute a judgment on their character, mm -hmm. and they're not unique in having such thoughts. Now, of course, when it's a question of delusional thinking, thought disorders, and so on, that's another matter. I'm talking more here about the existential reality that confronts all of us, including those whom we work with as therapists. And of course, to the extent that we can help our clients understand and own their projections on any level, and there's a lot of projecting going on, uh, that becomes an important part of our work in helping, I think, our clients to own and accept at least parts of their shadow. And to achieve success in doing this, I think it's important that we who are in the role of counselor or helper be aware of our own shadows, so that we don't get freaked out by the stuff that our clients present us with. But psychotherapy is not the only tool for increasing this kind of self-awareness. I think that spiritual practice plays an equally important role. <clears throat> Part of the hunger for self-knowledge and spiritual depth that I think we see in our culture today is this exponentially growing interest in spiritual traditions and practices that emphasize mindfulness and meditation, which is everywhere. I think that meditation, I say this as somebody who's been doing it for 20 years, I became a Buddhist 20 years ago, I'm still a Methodist minister, but I'm also a Buddhist. I think that meditation is a particularly helpful practice for improving this kind of self-awareness. When we can begin to clear the mind of all conscious thought and distraction and allow whatever lies beneath to emerge without fearing it or judging it, that's the important thing, without fearing it or judging it, I think we expand our awareness tremendously. Ronald Siegel writes about this in his book, The Mindfulness Solution. And Daniel Siegel, not related, also writes very helpfully about it in his wonderful little book, Mindsight. And both Siegels, who I don't think are related, incorporate mindful practice into the psychotherapy that they do. And it's helpful the way they describe that. I find myself doing this more and more in the 20 years since I've been a practicing Buddhist. Every religion has different forms of mindfulness practice, whether it be meditation, prayer, guided imagery, whatever. And I strongly believe that all such practice can be a helpful way of achieving greater self-awareness, which includes, at least to some extent, awareness of the shadow that we each carry. In the final analysis, I think that this kind of awareness is our best protection against destructive shadow projection. I don't think any of us, as I said before, can hope or expect to ever achieve full awareness of the shadow. I don't think we're capable of doing that. But whatever awareness we do achieve can only be helpful. It's like a kind of immunization against the pollution of collective shadow projection. And, and collective shadow projection is very contagious, and you can easily become polluted by it. The more aware we are of our own shadow contents, the better equipped we are to avoid being swept up by the collective shadow. I think that Jung has done a great service in helping us to see this kind of awareness as a key to positive mental health, and essentially, ultimately, key to finding some kind of peaceful coexistence in our lives.